Good morning. It is Tuesday, May 18th, 2021, and I call to order the Story County Board of Supervisors. Please stand if you are able and join us in stating the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Due to the ongoing pandemic and us limiting the number of individuals in our public meeting room, we're offering access to our meetings via Zoom, which is allowed under code section 21.8.1. With that, we'll move on to the adoption of the agenda, but I do have a couple additions or corrections to the agenda. First, under um, action forms, we need to add Timothy Patterson, uh, effective 5-9-2021 uh, for a pay adjustment. Under our consent agenda, number eight, we need to pull Grant Lemire's site development plan from the consent agenda. And from our other reports, number 15, one, uh, we're pulling the countywide watershed assessment and implementation matrix presentation uh, for today, which will be done at a later date. So with those changes, is there a motion to approve today's agenda with those three changes? I move approval of the agenda uh, with the stated changes. Second. Been moved by Faisal, seconded by Merkin. Faisal? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Pettins? Aye. Uh, next, we'll move on to public comment number one. This comment period is for the public to address topics on today's agenda. Is there anyone who would like to make comment, public comment today? If so, please hit the raise hand on your Zoom or press pound nine to unmute yourself. Seeing anyone, Leanne? Okay. Seeing none, we will close public comment number one. Next, we'll move on to consideration of the uh, proclamation declaring May 2021 as Mental Health Month. Um, Carla Webb brought this before us, and we do have the proclamation in front of us. And if Supervisor Basil, do you want to start off? Sure. Uh, whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well being, and whereas Mental Health America reports 9.7% of youth have severe major depression, this rate was highest among youth who identify as more than one race at 12.4%. Even before COVID-19, the prevalence of mental health illness among adults was increasing, an increase of 1.5 million people over last year's data. In addition, Mental Health America from January 2020 to September 2020 there was reported 93% increase in anxiety screenings and 62% increase in depression screenings. And whereas education is an effective way to reduce the stigma of mental health illness and whereas mental health illnesses are real and prevalent in our county, regardless of socioeconomic boundaries. And whereas we encourage our citizens to get help for mental health illnesses and to understand it is as important to treat as any other illness, such as diabetes or heart disease. And whereas any each business, school, government agency, healthcare provider, organization, and citizen shares the burden of mental health illnesses and has a responsibility to promote mental wellness and support prevention efforts. And whereas through increased awareness, we can achieve our goal to abandon negative stigmatism and reduce our acceptance of individuals seeking treatment. Then, therefore, we, the Story County Board of Supervisors, do hereby claim May 2021 is Mental Health Month in Story County, Iowa. We also call upon the citizens, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses, and schools of Story County, Iowa to commit our community to increasing awareness and understanding of mental health, the steps our citizens can take to protect their mental health and the need for appropriate and accessible services for all people with mental illness at all stages. Is there a motion to adopt today's mental health proclamation? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Merkin? Aye. Basil? Aye. Pettins? Aye. It is adopted. And Carla, I see you're on. I didn't know if you wanted to make any additional comments. Can you hear me now? 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Carla. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, board, for approving the proclamation. We do appreciate that. I just wanted to um, share also that this Thursday on May 20th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., the City of Ames is hosting a mental health public forum to connect residents with resources that are available um, currently in Story County. Uh, people can attend in person at the Ames City Auditorium, or they can attend remotely also through social media it, as it will be live streamed. The event also will be recorded in on the City of Ames's website. So just wanted to share that we encourage and invite uh, anyone that's interested to please attend uh, in person or remotely if, if they prefer. So thank you. Thank you for that information, Carla, and for bringing forth the uh, proclamation. You're welcome. And Carla, I believe we are going to put that on our website and in our and, and publicize it via social media as well. Okay, because great. That's wonderful. We would be interested in that. So thanks for bringing it to our attention. Uh, next, yep, thank you, Carla. Next one was on to agency reports. Uh, we have the re reports from the Salvation Army. Um, I yep, I see Carrie on. Carrie, you just need to unmute yourself. I think there we go. Can you hear me? You do, and we have your report. And uh, if you want to go over some highlights or things you want to expound upon, that would be wonderful. Okay, sure. Thank you so much um, for having me here today. And um, boy, was it a weird year. And of course, um, you know, the pandemic isn't over. And so um, we've had to make a lot of adjustments in the services that we provided over the past year. Um, for example, our doors have been closed since March of last year, which is um, similar to most of the other agencies um, in town um, and of course in the county. Um, we've been, what we've been doing with our food pantry is actually taking orders um, so a person calls in and, and we ask them um, just a variety of questions. Uh, for example, if they have food allergies or um, is there anything that they wouldn't want us to pack because we want to minimize food waste? Um, and then um, like what kind of meat they want and different things like that. And then we have set up a, a way um, in our vestibule to set the food there. Um, our volunteers package all of that and then the um, our, our guests just come in and pick that up. And so that has worked out pretty well. If there's been any questions, we've been able to answer that um, for them and then provide resources for other places that they can go for food. Um, our homelessness prevention services, we've been taking, um, again, phone interviews, and in some cases, Zoom calls when people have the ability to do that. Um, our payees have been, uh, we've actually continued to see them weekly because just the, the manner in which we provide that service uh, means that they have to pick up a check every week. And we've worked really well um, with, their, with their staff and with them in teaching them about the importance of um, wearing their mask out in public and when they come for their services. Um, one of the things that we plan to start doing is actually uh, mirroring a, a program that Micah started. Um, so we'll be delivering food to some people. Um, we're going to start with the city of Ames and then um, spread out if we can make that work. Um, so we'll, we'll begin doing that um, probably by June 1st. So that's pretty exciting news for us. Um, so county fund wise, um, there's a report there that talks about em emergency disaster services. And really a lot of what we do is prepare. Um, we talk internally about how we're going to manage when there's a disaster. And I had a, a student assist me in sort of um, uh, getting my phone chain and things ready. 
Um, so that was uh, good work on her part. And then as far as hunger relief um, with our food pantry, as you can see, we've served a lot of people this year, um, a little over 7,000 people. And that was 2,475 separate visits to the pantry. Um, and another um, 1,483 to our market. Um, we're also helping out food uh, um, pantries and food desert areas. And I think that's important because that, that helps families. Um, they don't have to drive to Ames to get, to get extra food. So we've been helping Cambridge, Colo, Nevada, Story City, and Zeering by giving them food, um, sandwiches and meat and different things that we have that um, we feel blessed to have here. Um, we've gleaned over 100,000 pounds of food, so we can't possibly get all of that out, so we like to share it. Um, and then, you know, we're also seeing brand new families. We saw 12 households um, that we've never seen before, and we've also been serving um, many households that are homeless. Um, and typically that's because the, either the shelters are full or they're living in uninhabitable sites or they're doubling up. So um, I talked about um, the other programs um, as far as uh, homelessness prevention, food pantry, but what I wanted to mention also was our payee program. And um, we've just expanded that to bring in a few more people. Um, and so we're seeing 62 clients right now. Um, 58 of those reside in Story County. The ones that don't reside here started here and moved away. And it's a, it's very hard to find a payee. So we've stayed with some people. Um, and in other cases, we've transferred over those services. So um, my intent, um, we have two people on the waiting list right now. And my intent is to um, have those two people in service. Um, that would be the very first time we've not had a waiting list in probably six years. So, <laughs> um, so then I just wanted to touch on the fact that um, everything we do has to do with the volunteers that we get um, to come play with us, I guess, every day. And um, so we work with the Volunteer Center of Story County and, and then Retired Senior Volunteer Program. Um, they help us to meet our needs. Uh, it, it's always amazing to look at those volunteer stats. So when I found out that the Volunteer Center of Story County um, could potentially be closing at the end of June, it made my stomach and my heart drop a little. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the ripple effect that's going to have, um, not only throughout the other nonprofit agencies in the county, but um, how that's going to affect us. Um, we have a lot of Christmas volunteers that come to us through them, and we have food pantry and payee volunteers that help us, and we find them, um, of course, through our RSVP, but um, Volunteer Center is one of the primary places. Um, so, and then I've also shared that um, CICS is no longer going to, uh, so we have about 25 to 26 clients who are getting services through CICS, but there was a decision that was made that um, though we're grandfathering those in who currently are being, um, services are being paid for, but we're not um, able to require or request services for anybody um, that would be new. So we're a little concerned about that. Um, we're going to have to find funding elsewhere. And um, I guess the ones I'm really concerned about are those people that um, they're already very low income and having to pay for services if we don't have um, an, an outlet for that. So that's what we're doing. Um, does anybody have any questions about what services we've been providing? Carrie, this is Lisa. I just, I'm going to start off with a question. Yeah. Um, on your, your, where you're taking orders or whatever for your pantry or market over the phone and having it for 
you know, the, your clients to come in and, and pick up. Were you, were yep. you maintaining kind of the same amount of clients that you've had, or was that an uptick in clients? No, it's been really weird. Um, and, and I guess one would expect that, that people would stay home in a pandemic. So our numbers did drop. Uh, they're starting to slowly come back up. Um, but we have seen fewer people this past year. But we're, I think we're still helping the same number when we consider that we're giving food to the other pantries. And those people who would normally come here don't have to drive to Ames. Um, what those numbers would look like, I'm not sure, but it seems logical to me that, that there would be a benefit to families not having to drive here. Um, we've been giving out the same amount of food, maybe a little extra food to the families that have been coming, but um, yeah, it's, it's starting to climb back up, but it's not to those, those numbers uh, prior to the pandemic starting. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Carrie, this is Linda. Do you have yep. a plan on when you're going to open your doors to your office and be willing to serve people on a walk-in basis? Um, that's a great question. And no, I don't have an answer to that. One of the things um, that we contend with is a very small space. And we've added some refrigeration and um, um, some other things on the inside uh, of our building. And so it's very hard it's going to be very hard to have people inside like we did in the past. So we're going to have to figure that out um, until people, I have another staff person that had to wait to get fully vaccinated and she won't be, that probably won't be till like, I think our second one will take place towards the end of June. I'd feel a lot more comfortable if everybody that, that is here is fully vaccinated. Um, and so our staff will be, and most of our volunteers are seniors. And so they've been very um, diligent about that as well. So um, the answer is that's the long answer. The short answer is I'm not quite sure. Sounds like you're moving in that direction though, and you've got some criteria. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I of course I we're gonna have to pay attention to the to the city and the county mandates um, on mask use and and even after that, I feel like we're gonna require people to have a mask on when they come in. Um, we just want to be safe. Appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Carrie, it's Latifa. Um, have have you started brainstorming um, different ideas for uh, funding the rep payees, the new ones? Um, you know, no, because well, there's a couple things. Um, one is that I need to sit down with with the. Um, payee supervisor and have a conversation about what that looks like for the people who are no longer going to be funded. Um, and then the other thing is, is that um, I do want to look into any of the um, banks and such that might be willing to do grants or um, support the service that we're providing. Um, that hasn't happened yet. I'm not at all comfortable in going and meeting face to face with somebody about that. And I feel like that's what it really takes is to sit down and talk to somebody about what the program looks like. Um, but no, um, I haven't. And, and I, I really don't want that burden to fall on the backs of the clients who um, really struggle. Some of them have very low income and some of them do well. 
um, and and we keep them under that 2000 mark so that they can continue to have services. And when that's the case, and when there's somebody who maybe has their stimulus check or they have um, that right hovering around that 2000 range, they pay for their own service because they have the income to do that. So we just need to really kind of flush out what that's gonna look like. Representative payee clients who are not CICS clients and can't pay for the service? There are, um, I don't have a number on that. Um, what's happened though is what, especially like group home, um, we can't, we cannot charge for someone living in a nursing home. And so, uh, and that's required, that's just a social security rule. So we have a few people that are in nursing homes that um, either their family has said that they don't want to have their, if they're a guardian, they don't want to have their parent, um, they don't want their funds to be managed by the nursing home just to keep that separation. Um, so those people are, are ones we still have to work, do the work, but they don't have a lot of, they have like $50 to work with. Um, and then there are some who just, you know, that they have the minimum of SSI and um, after all the bills are paid, it's a, it can be a, a stretch, but I can, I, if you need those numbers, I'd be willing to try to figure that out for you. Options that were out there. Um, I'm sorry, what was that? I was just wondering what other options there were out there for you to get paid for doing the representative pay for, for pay. Yeah. And I, also, yeah. I, I must have missed the CICS thing. Maybe Lisa, what, do you know why that decision I don't is? remember. I think it's because it wasn't a core service that needed I'm to sure yeah I'm sure that it's it's the core service piece um the same thing happened is happening I'm on the legal aid board and the same thing is happening with them as well okay so it wasn't CICS saying we don't care we don't think that's valuable no, they were just no saying, hey, not at all in fact um it was generous to even keep the ones on that had it <laughs> Um, they could have cut all of those people and they didn't. Now, I don't know what that's going to look like in a year, um, sure. but, you know, we'll have to wait and see. This is Carla. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So what happened with the representative payee service? Um, we, in reviewing our management plan, our plan has a section in there that talks about co-payments and client participation costs. And the plan actually states that those costs are required, um, that are required by federal, state, region, or municipal programs in which the individual participates shall be required to be paid by the individual. So as SSA um, allows entities to charge that, that monthly fee, I think it's like $45 a month right now. Um, that's, a, that's a fee that SSA allows entities to charge. We, look, we need to look at that as a client participation fee that's been the responsibility of the individual. Um, we determined that actually we, we weren't following our management plan for this section. And so we needed to try and transition so that we were in compliance with our plan. So that's what happened. So we wanted to hold harmless those individuals who we had been paying on. Um, so those folks are grandfathered in, but any, any new individuals, we wouldn't be able to, to pay those costs because it is viewed as a client participation fee. Um, like residential care facilities, um, there's also a client participation fee that individuals are responsible for paying for, and we don't cover those, those costs. So um, we needed to just get in line with what our plan actually states. So that's what happened. You are right, it's not a core service, um, but it, it was more due to needing to uh, be in line with what our plan states. Thanks, thanks for that information, Carla, because I could not recall from our meeting discussion on that. Any additional questions? 
Um, I guess I guess it would be a similar question for uh, uh, volunteers. Have you been brainstorming um, ideas about recruiting volunteers or um, advertising on your website or anything? Yeah. Um, so we do that some, and we do still. Um, you know, RSVP uh, has. Um, the, they do a good job of um, really looking at the people who are, are interested in providing um, volunteer hours somewhere and they um, direct them to us. And then a lot of times we'll ask the volunteers to bring a friend. <laughs> so um, just, you know, bring a friend. And, and sometimes that's, that is, it works out beautifully because suddenly you have two people who are friends working together at, you know, say the food pantry. Um, the other thing is, is that um, we had been getting Iowa state students to volunteer. And I, I had an interesting conversation with one of them last, well, actually we had two kids last week or two kids this past semester neither one of them found the volunteer opportunity here through um, any other place than, so when they Googled volunteering, they found the volunteer center of Story County. They didn't, I asked them if they were aware of any options on their, on campus that provided that volunteer portal and neither one of them knew that there was anything available. So there's gonna have to be a lot of work on the end um, of Iowa State, making sure that their students are aware that these things are out there um, in order for them to be connected to different volunteer opportunities. Okay, thank you, thank you yep. for that. You're welcome. Anything else? No. Thank you, Carrie, for your report and the additional information. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Sorry it took so long. <laughs> Have a good day. Thanks. Uh, next, we'll move on to consideration of minutes, and I think we want to separate the motions out for 5 4 and 5 11. Is that? <laughs> We're going to separate the motions okay. out. So, is there a motion to approve the May 4th? Minutes. Second. Been moved and seconded. Basil? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Heddens? Aye. The May 4th are approved. I would move to approve, approve the May 11th um, minutes with one change, and it would be under public, public forum number two to strike everything after the phrase public hearing item. And reason is simply because it's not a, it's not an inappropriate I mean it's not a comment it's it's a correct comment and it's a good reminder but it's nothing we talked about in the meeting so the comment should be stricken okay so any motion. discussion second second all right been moved and seconded um Merkin aye Basil aye Heddens aye uh, next, we'll move on to personnel actions. And if you recall, in my original or the original adoption, we did make the change at the, that, that particular time for the um, action form. Uh, so you uh, don't need to do anything additional. Okay, move approval of personnel actions. Second. Then moved by Faisal, seconded by Merkin. Faisal? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Heavens, aye. Uh, next, we'll move on to consent agenda. And this one again, too, is I. Uh, made notion that we are pulling number eight out of here in the original adoption of the agenda. I move approval of consent agenda as amended. Second. Then moved and seconded. Merkin? Aye. Basil? Aye. Tedens? Aye. We are now on to the, looks like the public hearing items. So we have second consideration of ordinance number 293 amending chapter 80 floodplain management program of the story county land development regulation good morning amelia good morning i have no changes or haven't received any comments since the last um, consideration 
And so we would recommend approval on the second consideration and waiving of the third consideration. Is there any discussion? I would move approval of ordinance 293, amending chapter 80, flood plain management program, Story County Clerk of Ordinances on second consideration and wait third consideration. Second. Been moved and seconded. Do we have uh, to have a public hearing? Sorry, sorry. I've got a, sorry, I've got to have. Sorry. Uh, I need to open for the public hearing item. So let's do that at this particular time. If anyone would like to make a comment, take a step back on that motion. Please raise your hand. Um, or unmute yourself, just click star nine to unmute yourself. And I apologize for that. My fault. I jumped. Got to step ahead of myself. We'll wait a few more seconds to see if anyone is sometimes they have a hard time unmuting or Leanne saying anything? No? Okay. So we will close the public hearing at this particular time. Now I will entertain a motion. I would move approval of ordinance 293, amending chapter 80, floodplain management program, and Story County Code of Ordinances on second consideration and waiving a third consideration. Second. Been moved and seconded. Faisal? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Pedans? Aye. Okay. Next, we'll move on to additional items. We have discussion and consideration of minimum safety requirements of tanning facilities. Directing, directing the Environmental Health Department to draft an ordinance uh, for a future public hearing. Um, Margaret, I think I saw you on there. Hmm. Yeah, I thought I saw, thought I saw her. You could, um, well, there's see. Matt, um, I see Matt there. Unmute him. Um, Margaret's on here. She might be having issues. Hang on just a second. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I saw her on and then She's signing back in right now. It crashed on her just as it was changing. Thanks, Matt. Good morning. Sorry about that. It, it shut me down right when you called my name. So, um, so today I, we decided that the best way uh, to go forward with um, adopting an ordinance for tanning requirements is to have the Board of Supervisors discuss the option that they choose out of the four that I presented in the attached document uh, and then tell environmental health which option they want and we will write that up for um, a future public hearing. So with that, I'll let you all decide. I know you've met with the Board of Health earlier and got their input as well. I do have a question. And it's regarding the attachment that was the email from um, IDPH, May 16, 2019. Okay. So this has been in effect for two years, and that's why we have an ordinance, because they're not, um, I guess I'm a little confused, Margaret. Okay. Um, uh, so Story County had the contract as, 
as well as other um, folks, had the contract to, um, sorry, I'm kind of unfocused today. So they have the contract to do the tanning um, and inspections and that contract was through IDPH. And then um, IDPH decided that they did not have the resources to implement that, um, that part of the contract um, and do their due diligence. So they decided to cancel the contract with all the counties for just the tanning. The contract still applies to the tattoo and the pool inspection program, okay? So that piece was taken out of the contract for all counties throughout Iowa. So, and then that document was to state that um, if a county wanted to go forward and still have a program, they needed to adopt an ordinance um, allowing um, and giving the authority to the county to do this. And then, um, so normally what one would do if you wanted to keep things status quo was to adopt the state uh, regulations by reference. Now, um, and then the Board of Health decided that they would also like to put some restrictions on the age of uh, people using the tanning facilities. And so there's two options for the tanning um, age restrictions. So one is no one under the age of 18 could tan. And then the second one would be no one under the age of 16 could tan. And then 17, 16 and 17 year olders would have to get permission from a parent uh, to be able to tan. Um, that second option is currently what Scott County has. I spoke to some of those inspectors and um, they, they haven't really done any inspections since the pandemic. So um, they do not know how difficult it is to enforce or if there are problems for the um, tanning facilities to, um, to require um, IDs and things like that. So today, um, you know, the four options are before you, um, the two age restrictions or do nothing or um, just uh, adopt the state uh, code by reference. And, um, and then when you decide, then environmental health will go ahead and write up an ordinance. We've already got that ready to go pretty much. And then um, we will have the resolution and the public hearing for that. Thank you, Margaret. And as you remember, the Board of Health has um, recommended twice now um, to go with the more stringent age restrictions uh, for tanning. And Margaret, if I understand the process, you're just looking for some direction here. Then you would put on the agenda notifying when the when the date when we're setting the date to have the public hearing, so that it can then be posted you know, publicized and then have the public hearing, correct? Correct. Okay, so it's a little different way of how this is coming before us because it's not an ordinance coming before us, but some direction for Margaret. Um, yeah. Thank you, Margaret, for the explanation. I have been never I looked at the, the second attachment, I did not see it was 2019, and I just saw the May date, and I thought, this isn't, I didn't understand that it wasn't new, so I think I was in the midst of answering my own question, so I probably had to go through something you didn't have to, but it's, it's useful. Um, so, direction? Yeah, and, and um, yeah, so she's given us four options. We could also direct her, or at least my understanding, to say she could, I mean, she could put forth just one resolution for us to consider. And if that's not that we want, then she would bring forth at another time a different one. Um, but we still have to go through the, the publication process as well as the public hearing process. That way I wouldn't have to spend, um, you know, I've already spent one round of money to publicize and uh, publish, and um, I, 
you know, doing two or three more would just really be expensive for my department. So I thought, well, you know, let's get it out there and then you guys can decide, you women can decide, sorry. And, um, and then we'll go forward with your decision. I, um, I'm still, I'm still going, my preference is still the uh, option three. Um, that we would adopt it in its entirety um, and prohibit clients under the age of 16 and only allow 16 and 17 year old clients to use any devices with their consent. I still have a preference of the, I don't think that was a motion, right? That was just discussion. It was just discussion. Okay. Yeah. Thought, and I better, I, thought I better make, yeah. yeah. And, and I'm happy to talk about my reasons or save them for public hearing. I don't, that, that's right. I mean, mine is still the under, under 18. I can see it both ways. I mean, I I can see being concerned about um, young people being allowed to tan. And, I mean, a lot of them can do this anyway. They can do tanning on their own in their own home, and it does not have some of the some of the restrictions and some of the safeguards that we may have if it's in a tanning salon, but um, I also know the Board of Health feels strongly to have the 18 provision, and um, but I um. I think I would be. I think I would be in favor of allowing sixteen and seventeen year olds to use tanning um, facilities with parents' consent, because that might keep them from doing things that might be more harmful. Kind of tanning on their own, unsupervised. So I would go with option three. And I really appreciate with the, the Board of Health all the information that they sent us. And I did not read everything word for word, but I did scan it and go through it. And I think there are good points, but I, I also think there can be dangers of 16 and 17 year olds are going to tan. Maybe it's better having them go to facilities where there is some regulation of how it gets done. Yeah, I, I, I read almost almost everything, it was a lot, um, which I appreciated. Um, and the thing that stood out to me the most was um, when they would talk about policies through legislation and regulation, the Surgeon General's call to action to prevent skin cancer report, um, talks about it on 36 and page 37. Um, and, uh, State stronger laws to regulate tanning salons and restricting access to them will not be as effective in the absence of increased controls on supervised tan on unsupervised tanning beds and direct sales to the public. Instead, they may drive people to indoor tanning, um, unsupervised tanning locations such as gyms, beauty salons, um, and. In another, in a 2019 skin cancer prevention progress report, um, I, and I believe both of these came from um, the doctors, um, the strategic approach to prevention, preventing or minimizing the impact of cancer among communities it involves state, local health departments, um, community organizations, researchers, um, cancer survivors, and their families all coming together to find and agree upon ways to address cancer concerns among their communities. Um, I'm just left feeling like maybe, um, maybe 
the answer is more addressing the access to, to unregulated tanning in, in uh, gyms and apartment buildings and um, you know, more education with families, um, more educational requirements for tanning facilities um, rather than just a hard, you're not allowed period. Um, because because we know they're going to anyway. Um, so I think my preference would be to work towards more education. Um, yeah. I you know I hear you both on that. I just look at it as cancer, and it's one way to control cancer. It's one way to control people being exposed to and potentially contract melanoma. Uh, which can kill people. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where I look at it is purely the healthcare component of it. Um, the doctors that spoke and said, what percentage of UV rays are appropriate? Well, they'll tell you none. You know, use your sunscreen is what they're telling you. Use your SPF 50 or whatever level you need to minimize any exposure um, because they are seeing the increase in your 20 and 30 year olds with skin cancers and tanning, uh, tanning beds can help facilitate, can facilitate that. So that's, um, that's where I'm at the under, the under 18. I agree, and that came through loud and clear through all of the uh, information they provided also. Um, I'm just thinking about what is the most effective way to impact that age group. Um, Looks like there would be since this discussion and consideration, we need to have a motion for direction that be accurate. It was supposed to be a consideration, but if she's wanting direction, then just do it as direction. Yep. Well, we're not unanimous, but two out of three of the supervisors are looking at option three. So I think that so. Yes, it is not unanimous, but it does sound like as direction that two of those three supervisors uh, would prefer you do option three. Okay. Okay. I'll write that up and, and get it on the Board of Supervisor agenda for next week if, if that's acceptable. So you put it on the agenda next week as to when you will be hosting the public hearing, correct? Yeah, so just the yes, date. The resolution will go on next week's agenda. All right, so just the date, not the actual ordinance yet. Correct. correct. Okay. All right, all right. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. I appreciate the effort you put into this. It was a lot of work. Appreciate everything you've done, Margaret, and we appreciate the Board of Health. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. So thanks for all the information. Next, we'll move on to, we've got a discussion of the face covering resolution. I know that Supervisor Faisal, you put this on the agenda. I know the CDC has come up with some new guidance and wanted to have just a little, I think, some clarifying discussion in regards to that. Yeah, yeah. I just felt like it was important that um, that we have a discussion about what, what our steps need to be or um, before we are even able to make any decisions. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted us to be able to talk about that because I know there are some limitations. Um, I'm, I think I'm gonna let, let you start just because right. the uh, regulation went into place before I was here, so. Sure, so we do have the Board of Health regulation regarding face coverings. Um, I believe that it does stipulate that the Board of Health needs to provide a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors whether we would make any changes or um, to dissolve or retract the, the um, regulation. Um, I spoke with the Chairman of the Board of Health. They are going to be having a meeting this Thursday uh, the 20th at 7 p.m. to discuss uh, the new guidance from the CDC um, and what, if any, potential changes they may make because of that or if they'll offer a resolution to 
uh, recommend dissolving the face covering resolution or uh, yeah, re a regulation. Um, if they make any changes, they will have to go through another public hearing process because it is still a rule. Um, they're just changing the rule. So they'd have to notify what those changes may be before then it would come to us. But if they were simply asking us to lift the rule, they would not have to have a public hearing. That is my understanding. They would just provide a resolution to us um, to, to lift the resolution. Okay. And I just looked up our ordinance and I'll just read this for the record for anybody who's interested in why our process is this. It's the last clause, 4.6. This regulation shall be lifted by resolution of the Board of Supervisors at the request of the Board of Health. At the earliest date is determined by the Board of Health using data and statistics available. So we are acting, so we put in our in our regulation that that we would need a board that we want the board of health recommendation before lifting it. So I was kind of checking myself. Yeah. Right now, mm -hmm. so. yeah. 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 So we put that on the agenda just so that folks that were wondering about our process would just understand the process before us um, that we are going through. And that's why, as I stated, the Board of Health will be having a meeting this Thursday at 7 p.m. The agenda is not posted yet, but I anticipate it would be posted either later today, but certainly by tomorrow, um, it will be posted. Any other discussion on that? Well, I would just mention that um, it seems like some, some places have already lifted some ordinances, some School boards have, several school boards I understand have not, have said they would continue with their face covering regulation till the end of the school year, which is a couple weeks from now. But just the reminder that if a city does lift its regulation, but then the county regulation still does apply until we do something there. Thank you for that. Okay, anything else? All right. We'll move on, on the agenda. We have no departmental reports. Um, other reports, uh, as we said, we are postponing the update on the countywide watershed assessment uh, matrix. Um, upcoming agenda items. Anyone have any upcoming agenda items? Margaret mentioned she will have something on the agenda regarding the tan tanning ordinance. Nothing else at this particular time that we're aware of. No. Okay, next we'll move on to public forum number two. Comments from the public on items not on this agenda. The board may not take any action on the comments due to the requirements of open meetings law, but may do so in the future. We'll open up for public comment time. Please raise your hand if you're on Zoom or press star nine. If you're on the phone to unmute yourself. We'll wait a few more seconds to see if anyone. Seeing anything, Leanne? Okay, we are seeing them, so we will close public forum number two. Um, supervisors, are you okay if we move on and not do the liaison updates at this particular time? I'm fine with that. Um, next, we have on our agenda, uh, it's closed, per, or is to go into closed session. Um, uh, which is allowed under IO code section 21.51C. Do we need, yes, yes we need yes, a motion. motion. I move to go into closed section pursuant to Iowa code section 21.51C to discuss matters with strategy with council. Um, second. Been moved and seconded. Merkin? Aye. Basil? Aye. Eddins? Aye. I need mean, just five minutes. Okay, yes, we're going to take a five minute break and we'll be going into closed session. Okay, we are back in open session after discussion uh, from our closed session meeting. Is there a motion or any further? Is there a motion? I would move that we not appeal the decision in Country Sunrise to state properties and others against the Story County Board of Drainage District Number Five. I have a second. It's been moved by Merkin and seconded by Faisal. Merkin, aye. Faisal, aye. Heddens, aye. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. 
Been moved and seconded. Basil? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Pedans? Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you.